bottle brewing. Now, what's interesting is, is to get your child on the waiver waiting list, they don't do the financial qualification. So there are many parents that have their children on the Medicaid waiver waiting list, and the child does not qualify because the child already has 2,000 or more in accounts, government bonds, you know, et cetera, in their names. Everybody follow what I'm saying? And when they get the letter saying your child's now been targeted, then they do the financial qualification. And at that point, when you go into the office and they ask you to disclose X, Y, Z, if you produce, you know, the statement that shows the bank account or this or that and so forth, if it totals more than $2,000, then your child is, is denied access to Medicaid, which means no funding for the waiver. It's a Medicaid thing. It's not the beads office. It's Medicaid. So the beads office releases you to the FSSA office. You go to get your Medicaid so your waiver is funded, and Medicaid stops you on a dime. Everybody follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So generally not a good idea. Now, at the same time, if you have accounts or assets in the name of your child's special needs, and you're kind of thinking, whoops, you know, we may need to do something about that, you're probably right. But please, please understand, I'm not making a blanket recommendation that you go out and liquidate accounts, et cetera. That really needs to be addressed on an individual situation. Because there is a certain way to go about doing this, and if done the wrong way, you may attract unwanted attention to your situation, and the timing for that may be particularly bad. So this is where we get into the individual consultation, because you'll actually bring in statements, and we'll look at statements and assets and all the factors to your situation to figure out what really is working well for you, and what's going to be a problem for you. Uh, but that's, that's question number one. Now, okay, so once we've resolved basically having little to nothing in their name, so they're eligible for that, and eventually potentially SSI or Medicaid or other, uh, other benefits as they get older, then the issue becomes what about when something happens to you? Because when something happens to the parents, where does the money go? To the kids, generally. You know, I mean, you know, when we're gone, it's all about the next generation, you know, that type of thing. Well, the bottom line is, is if your child with special needs inherits... Over 2,000 bucks. Right, they've got a problem. Yeah. And that will pull the rug on most benefits that you have potentially spent years and tons of paperwork right. getting them qualified for. And you may wait a year or two years to get them on the waiver. Once they have $2,000, it's the first of the following month. They're done. So the state will make you wait for access, but when it comes to a lack, lack of eligibility, they'll pull the plug immediately. Um, and so they, they can't have the, the, the $2,000. Now, as a result of that, that's where we get into the special needs trust issue. Because then the question is, okay, well, let me see if I got this right. The kid that needs the most help, the kid that needs the most money, <laughs> you're telling me you can't have it. So we've got a problem here because we're trying to allocate resources to the child of greatest need, and you're telling me if we allocate to the child of greatest need, we're going to hurt them instead of help them. Does everybody get the idea? Okay. So it's a conundrum. And so fortunately, in the late 80s and early 90s, legislation was passed that brought about the special needs trust that several people have brought up here. And um, a lot of law been before Congress, and the success of bringing this about basically was to give parents like yourselves the opportunity to set up what's called a special needs trust, which is a special type of trust. And if done properly, assets and resources placed in a special needs trust are not counted against the $2,000 requirement. And that means they can have thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. There's really no cap or limit, and they can have that in a special needs trust. And the idea is to let the government do as much heavy lifting as possible. And then to let the trust pay for what the government can't or won't. Another way to explain it is, is as long as my wife and I are drawing breath, we're going to be there to help ensure that our son has a good quality of life. Does that make sense? Now, as I've shared with you earlier in our journey, we have pushed, we have pushed, pulled, held, cajoled, everything we can to try to enable him to contribute to his quality of life as much as possible. But we recognize the fact that he is likely to struggle to provide for himself the quality of life that he has been accustomed to with our help. Does this make sense? Absolutely. And so, he, if, if by the grace of God he's able to finish college, we realize that we may potentially have issues of underemployment, undercompensation, we may have job changes, you know, we, 
it's what I call, and you talked about the crystal ball and not knowing how everything is going to turn out and so forth, it's what I call a buggy ride. Because it's not as though being on the spectrum goes away, like the season, you know, spring goes away and summer gets here. It's ever present. And now that he's 20, my wife and I have come to the conclusion that it's not like the cold or flu where you take a pill and eventually it goes away. It's a part of who he is. And so our great journey has been to do everything we can to help mitigate the effects of the condition. Does that make sense? To help him be everything he could possibly be in spite of these issues. But we've also come to the conclusion that we're not going to make him someone he's not. Does that? And that we will celebrate the successes. And they are all the sweeter for the great effort that's given from us and from others to help him get there. Is, does that resonate? Yeah. And so, therefore, we feel that sense of wanting to make sure we help maintain the quality of life. And, and you know, for most kids on the spectrum, there's no reason to believe they won't make it till 90 or 100. It's not a chromosomal issue that projects an early departure at 30 or 40. Everybody? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. you know, Alice and I, you know, feel that sense of, wow, we're not going to be here forever. And when we're not, how will our good works continue? How will his quality of life continue to be maintained? Not planning in such a way that contributes to his being lazy or not feeling the need to lift a hand or do. But again, where he's doing everything he can. Government's helping some, and then the trust takes care of the rest. And also to try to avoid a situation where he becomes a financial drain or burden against his siblings. Because we want them to reach for the moon, and so forth. So question number one deals with this resource issue. Because realistically, $2,000 is the law. The good news in Indiana is until June 1st of last year, it was $1,500. And finally, after decades, Indiana stepped up and joined the $2,000 club, which is the federal one. Previous to that, we've been at $1,500. But again, got to keep, got to keep it under $2,000. Because, please understand, you can't underestimate the value of the government benefits. This is not just $16,000 a year. This is disability and Medicaid. And please understand that eventually they will come off your group health insurance. That's the biggest thing I realized when I got Medicaid. Because I'm like, we have 40 hours of therapy. You know, we've been on the waiting list for a long time. We got to turn it better. I'm like, we have four years of therapy. How much more therapy do I need through this waiver program? That's not it at all. What, and we have insurance, and we've got Anthem. He, my son's fully insured there. It's the Medicaid insurance. Right. That is, and that's permanent. It's it's huge. You know, it's, it's right. so that's not going to go away. I'm missing so I'm missing that. What it is is the Medicaid. It's health insurance. Right. It's, it's mm -hmm. Medicaid health insurance. So he'll have that. Problem. Oh, oh, oh. So when he my aunt does he doesn't age out. No, ever, ever. I mean, the affordable health care is 26 and they're done. So he'll have that as long as he has an autism diagnosis, as he meets the criteria. So it's permanent interest, and I'm telling you, I'm going to I'm going to say, well, all, those, all prescriptions, I mean, it's just like the government just takes it. So I was just amazed. That's what it, to me, is it gives you a peace of mind. With, it gives you that health insurance. And I will tell you, a positive thing I learned from a caseworker that, I mean, I just picked one out of the blue. The first time I met him, it was, you know, you're like, okay, you have these people now that you have to meet with, and it's just more time. But all, what their goal is, is long term. Mm -hmm. And that was huge to me. I'm like, thank you for putting this in front of me. He's like, so what's your long term goal? I mean, this is a complete stranger to me. And I'm like, well, I'm going to live forever. And he's like, oh, my work's here. You know? And, that's, and he's just like, no, we need to, you know, he's like, you know, he sat down and he's like, okay, so what are you going to do? You know, we'll get you through the guardianship process when it's time. We'll get you through. Sure. And, and those people have done it. And the case managers have done that yep. and worked through this because it's lifetime. Right. It's lifetime. So, uh, yeah, boy, uh, that, that was mm -hmm. amazing what you just shared. Yes. And I try to help parents understand because while kids are young, they may not see the, right. the value of simply the waiver yeah. services. Because there's some community yeah. habitation, there may be some music therapy. You know, and it's like, yeah, this may help a little respite. Like, you know, kid goes with me everywhere. I don't need a professional babysitter, etc. But with the waiver comes the disability Medicaid, which is long term, and there is no other way to get it in most family situations until they're at least 18. So early is better. Early is uh, is better. 
but maintaining qualification has to include uh, they're not accumulating these assets or resources. So from a planning standpoint, using the special needs trust, so as, as is the case with me, you saw in the practice brochure, I have three kids. I have Liz, I have Emily, and then there's Matthew. So everything for Matthew is set to go to his special needs trust. So his share of my life insurance, you know, if, if something, if I'm death of my wife and I, you know, in our case, it's all my wife. Uh, we we got married 30, over 30 years ago, and it's always just, it's been the two of us. You know, we neither, in our case, been married to someone else. So if something happens to one of us, it all goes to the other. But the contingent or the backup beneficiary is, you know, a trust for the other two and then a trust for Matthew. And so in Matthew's case, he has a special trust unlike the girls because we do not want his trust to have an end date, meaning it isn't because he has 30 candles on the cake that suddenly he gets his two, three, or four hundred thousand dollars. That'd be a disaster. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and I'll tell you, even for your kids that are higher functioning, and some of you may have kids that are higher functioning, like I'm Matthew, where he has a driver's license, etc. And some look at me and they're like, oh, you've got it made. My gosh, the kid's in college, he got a driver's license, he got a diploma, you know, your worries are over. You know, and I'm thinking, come with, with us for a few days, and you'll know, you'll know that being high functioning mean, mean he is out there. <laughs> running into all kinds of stuff and, and and we're running interference and i'll tell you we we are concerned we are concerned if something happened to us and he got a significant inheritance i i, I gotta tell you he seeks peer acceptance all kids do the kids on the spectrum are often desperate for it and if someone acts like they want to be their friend oh my gosh you know and then, of course, my wife and I are concerned because he'll wear them out in a week or two. You know, I've got a friend, I've got a friend, I've got a friend, friend, you know, friends coming over and so forth like that. And to his credit, actually, in his first year of college, he had two people come to the house. And that's more than we've seen in years. Because I've got to tell you, once he exited elementary school, the social invitations went to nothing. There were no birthdays. There were no you know, get together with friends. I mean, no one coming our way, no one going, he, he wasn't going anywhere. I mean, it, it was a zippo zero, not. And so my wife and I, we stepped up, and we just did everything as a family. And we didn't make an issue of it, that type of thing. You know, our heart, hearts broke, because we knew how things were when we were kids, and so forth like that. But, you know, um, so the point I'm making here is, is that if he has a lot of money, he may suddenly have friends, mm -hmm. but they're fair weather. And I wouldn't want funds I leave for him that I'm hoping will be his financial safety net and help ensure his quality of life. To be taken advantage of, absolutely. You know, and he may eventually find someone, the potential exists that he may find someone and get married, maybe have kids, this type of thing. But I know my son. And it's going to take someone really special. And does the potential exist that two, three years into a marriage relationship, she wakes up one day and says, I love you to death and I hate to break your heart, but I can't do this thing. And these are some of the things that you kind of start to come to terms with if, as your child's not four, six, or seven, but is 20. And so we feel that, you know, our need to protect him and provide for him beyond the two of us is as real at his age 20 and a college student as it was when he was four or five. Is this? Yeah. So, so the trust is, 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 in most situations, the most effective vehicle to do that. Now, you as parents can uh, provide funding for the trust when something happens to you. We also set up the trust where it can be funded in the present, which means something doesn't have to happen to you. If you have funds and want to put in there, you can. Grandparents or other interested parties or family members can make gifts or, or make deposits. Uh, you know, sometimes I have grandparents that are setting money aside for college, that type of thing, and they're like, well, what do we do with this one? You know, that type of thing. Well, the trust can be funded. So it's like, you know, $1,000 to this one, 1000 to that one, and 1000 into the special needs trust. And so these are flexible, and we set them up so that, you know, and, and there's actually a letter that we put together to announce the trust 
and it's very tactful, but it, it puts the whole family on the same page that we've done some planning, we've created something for Matthew, and if you want to participate, that's up to you, or if you want to sprinkle something among the grandkids, you know, your estate plan, that's fine, just when it comes to sprinkling Matthew, this trust, <laughs> it's time to do. So, uh, questions? Questions? I, I have a quick one. Uh, it's just, if someone leaves me, a grandparent leaves myself money, can I put that in a trust and not have tax liability for me? Like, say, you know, my parents pass away and they leave me money or grandparents, mm -hmm. and, you know, I don't need, need that money right now, so I want to put it in my son's special need trust. What does that do? Okay, uh, great question. Well, in that in that situation, the trust would actually have its own tax ID number. Right. Now, assuming you would be the trustee on the trust, you would file a tax return for the trust, right. but the trust would pay its own taxes. Right. So, um, so the 1099 would come in the name of the trust, mm -hmm. and you'd do a 1041 instead of a 1040, right. which is uh, yeah. for entities and trusts. Correct. So you'd file a return for the trust, and then the trust out of the trust, you would uh, access sufficient funds to pay any tax liability. And it just depends upon uh, how much income you have for the trust as to what the taxes are. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, because at some small amounts, the trust may have an advantage over your situation. At larger amounts, sometimes the trust tax rates. Um, uh, in other words, trust tax rates, it's a different scale. Yeah, it can be right. higher, it can be lower, it depends on the situation. What would you do to me? Like, I gift it to the trust? Right. Is that, that right. You? You'd have no tax for making the gift, nor would you have a deduction because the trust is not a 501c3. Okay. But, and is there a limit on how much I can gift the trust? Um, uh, yeah, well, yes. Generally, it's the $14,000 annual gifting limit per person giving, per person receiving. Okay. Um, in some circumstances, uh, there, we may be able to go further by considering the, the um, remainder beneficiaries of the trust as well. Okay. Um, in terms of how many fourteen thousands can be gifted. Okay. Um, and that's per person gifting. So sometimes if you spread money around, we have multiple people make, doing the gifting. There you go. Right. Right. Husband, wife. There yeah. you go. Got it. Yeah. I understand. Okay. So um, so special needs trust is a powerful vehicle. Also, please understand, you don't have to have money to put in it today. This is a process not limited to the wealthy. I mean, I have. I have the same moms occasionally come in, you know, that would only dream of your situation. I'm telling you, living in Section 8 housing, trying to survive on child support, you know, and and um, maybe SSI or something, you know. Um, so the trust can remain dry for decades and simply be funded upon the death of, of the parent. And in those situations, sometimes we were able to secure just an inexpensive term policy, you know, so that if something happens to that parent, at least for the next 20 or 30 years, there's going to be something for the trust. And for young people, that premium can be, you know, 20 bucks a month or something ridiculous, you know, that we're able to do. Uh, so we, we have a way to help every family regardless of their circumstance. And I'll tell you, on the other end, I mean, I have families that come in that, you know, have, you know, um, you know, they've got their beach house and wherever and their, you know, this and, and their situation is really complicated and they have significant net worth and, you know, and so forth. Um, I know just a few months ago I had a partner in one of the largest law firms in the state come in and we assisted with their planning, you know, and, uh, and that was quite a different financial reality from what I just mentioned. Uh, so it's all about special needs, you know, and, and we're, we're there to help families no matter their, their circumstance. Um, okay, identifying a care provider, we touched on this a moment ago. Um, what, what we found is this. Family would like to step up. But we find that the hesitancy, like that brother that I was talking about, and so forth, the hesitancy family has typically falls into two camps. Number one, financial. And it's not that it, you know, it's not that they don't want to help or be generous. In most cases, you're going to place your child or children with another family situation. It's usually not the, the uncle that's 50 years old that's never been married and has no children. Do, do you follow what I'm saying? Usually it's another family setting. And they're thinking educating their kids. And they're thinking retire someday. And they're thinking they both work. And maybe you've got stay-at-home situation. You see what I'm saying? And so the finance, finances are an issue. And so when you enter into the conversation, if instead of if something happens to us, you'll take care of the kids, and they're thinking, including that. Instead of that, it's we've entered into a planning process. We're creating a special needs trust because we realize Matthew has significant issues. And we're going to make certain that his trust is well funded so that there's sufficient resources to meet all the needs that he's going to have and he won't be a financial burden. Is this making sense? 
so that you, in essence, right up front, take the financial issue off the table. And then go further and create something called a letter of intent because the other holdback is they're scared to death, shaking in their boots, they don't understand special needs, they, they know that if Matthew eats the wrong thing, it could kill her. And they're like, we don't know how to do that stuff. You know, and, you know so uh, the letter of intent is all things, in my case, Matthew. So your child's name is Owen. Owen, so all things Owen. Everything from how to get him up in the morning, how to get him to bed at night, all the personal hygiene issues, what he can do by himself, what he needs assistance with, all the food issues, food likes, dislikes, food allergies. Are you doing gluten-free or casein-free? Do you have any special considerations there? Are you doing supplements at all, etc.? You know, his favorite flavor of ice cream, birthday cake, or, or do you have dairy <laughs> issues? And if you, if you want to take him out for an ice cream cone, then does he need to uh, take his... Um, his lactate. Lactate, thank you, which Matthew is like... So he, which Matthew has to do. So we have graders down in Indianapolis. If you're putting graders in days ice cream. But you've got to have black tea, you know, and so forth. So, um, you know, the letter of intent is all things. Also, it's the beads contact, the, the caseworker, the providers. You know, uh, it's a copy of the IP, his immunization records, uh, you name it. And so we have a template to help families build this. Because I'll tell you, when you enter into the conversation, if you take the money off the table, and then you take how to do it off the table, there's usually not a lot left on the table. And so we this is a, a legal document. Correct. It's it an informational not. document. It's a guide. Precisely. Right. And we even have a little word document, so as young children, for young children, you can key it in and save it, and then just simply edit and update it as providers, doctors, you know, et cetera, change, medications, et cetera. And so we help we help with uh, with this, and we have found uh, we've made tremendous strides in families signing on because in essence you're demonstrating you're doing everything in your power to make it work, and it just really calls upon them to respond. Um, although a humorous situation, we have a few minutes I can share. <laughs> uh, an executive uh, with a young young brands uh, in Louisville, because young brands has significant presence in, in Louisville. Uh, first generation immigrant from China, has an MBA and he works international with young brands, uh, um, and he and his wife again from China. And um, at uh, anyway, she stayed home mom, they have two boys, and one uh, is, is, signif is significantly affected uh, by autism. And um, so we started the planning process. And while they had family back in China, um, you know, the father, the executive from Yang, uh, made no bones about the fact that uh, the boys would not be going back to China. Um, and I really didn't ask, but the impression I got is, is that the child on the spectrum would not get the support. Um, and uh, so, uh, at any rate, we got to the point of, hmm, well, the families, they were not here. <laughs> and um, so we, we, we got to that point, and uh, we were talking to who, and they're looking at each other, and they mentioned that there was one. Um, I think distant relative on the East Coast of medical school or something, but they didn't know much about her, and the only other uh, family member was an aunt living in San Francisco that was single, and they didn't think that was going to work, and that was it. And with that, the, the wife turned to the husband with her broken English and said, I told you we should join dinner club. We have no friends. <laughs> and we literally had to put the process on hold. And I kid you not, about six months later uh, came an email and the subject was found Fred. <laughs> <laughs> and we really got back together and finished the finished the planning, finished the planning process. Oh well. So let her own the You might be curious as to what can go into a special needs trust, and the answer is whatever you have. So whatever it is that you're going to divide up among your kids when you're both gone or you or you and the spouse are gone. Uh, can be directed to a special needs trust. Property, investment, retirement funds, life insurance. I have special needs trust with IRAs in them, um, trusts that are set for farmland to go to them, uh, and then the trustee will hire professional farm management so the income from the farm will take care of the disabled child, and then when the disabled child dies, the farm will still be in the family. And that was their concern, that, you know, we own land. That's what we own. That's what we have to give to our Daughter special needs trust, and she has ordered dis uh, corpus callosum. It's a significantly affecting condition. Um, probably will not be among those that live to be 70 or 80, this type of thing. And he said, God provide for her, and so uh, they've got it set up where you know, X number of 
uh, farmland acres goes to the trust, they'll have professional management, and the income from the farm takes care of her, and upon her death, then the farm will pass over the family. So there are all kinds of creative things that we can do with special needs trust because we, it's what we do every day. Uh, but you name it, by beneficiary designations, by will, by transfer on death, by payable on death, POD, TODs, beneficiaries, etc. Um, we, we can, whatever it is that you have. Uh, life insurance can be a helpful tool in funding a special needs trust. For many of us, we do well to pay our bills, especially with the additional financial burden of having a dependent with special needs. And so the issue becomes, boy, a special needs trust sounds great, but what if most of the money's gone by the time I die? You know, between, uh, you know, living through retirement and the needs for care for my wife and I, that type of thing. And so in uh, some cases, life insurance can create the funds at a parent's death that they might have struggled to accumulate to fund the trust with while they were here. And so we do that, and I have access to most of the industry, and so I am absolutely um, all over, you know, looking for the best value for families, etc. And we really uh, go great to great lengths uh, to provide the best, find the best carrier, the best you know, uh, uh, value, so to speak, to help premium dollars go the furthest in providing for your child's special needs. The beneficiary issue, this is huge. Um, I would venture to say that it is rare for someone to come into the office and know who all their beneficiaries are. Uh, now, occasionally someone may have all their primary beneficiaries correct, but contingents are rarely 100% in line. Either they're missing, I put down a spouse contingent, I don't know, kids are too young, I wasn't sure what to do, so I think I left it blank. Or I put a parent down. Um, in your case, primary, or it could be, in a married situation, it could be a contingent. Uh, or I put my sibling down because I figured that's who the kids would go to if something happens to me, like my sister who lives in San Jose, as an example, this type of thing. None of those options are particularly attractive for a variety of reasons. Having no contingent beneficiary on retirement accounts and life insurance means you subject the life insurance and retirement funds to probate. Absolutely. Which means the attorney is going to charge to process that through. It's going to take potentially months. And in addition to that, with regards to qualified assets, most likely they're going to be subjected to tax as opposed to the potential that the recipient could have stretched them over many, many years, minimizing tax implications. So no contingent beneficiary is, is rarely a good idea. As far as designating someone other than the child because they're a minor, what you're doing is you're creating a situation where they may have a moral obligation, but there is no legal obligation. And life may happen to them. If they become disabled and someone starts conducting their affairs, those funds that they're holding for someone else may or may not be used for your children. They may die, in which case those funds become a part of their estate, go to their heirs, your children will receive none. It's very risky business to place assets that you want to benefit your children with someone else, regardless of their heart or their character. So you start to see how you know, options are, are troubling. And in this, in this legalistic society, it, it, it's more difficult than ever because there was a time maybe when common sense would reign. But, but these days, you know, everything is, is so um, 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 litigious and, uh, and legalistic. So the beneficiary issue is huge. So what we do is, is we help families update all of this. And, and I've had families come in and have a dozen or two dozen different accounts. I mean, the IRAs, the, uh, the Roths, uh, everything. And I have beneficiary specialists on staff that will meticulously record trust language and get all this stuff wired correctly and updated, et cetera. So everything is going where it needs to go when something happens to you or you and your spouse. It's, it's, a, uh, uh, it's a labor of love to help families with this. There is a type of life insurance you may never have heard of. Most have not. And it's called survivorship life. And it is actually the rage in two-parent situations for special needs trust funding. What it is, is it's a coverage that ensures both parents together under a single policy. So like for myself, Alice and I, insured together under one policy. It's not designed to provide for either one of us. In fact, it doesn't generate a benefit if she dies, or if I die. But when the second one of us dies, it guarantees a benefit to fund Matthew's trust. So it's called survivorship life, it's called that, or second to die, because it generates a benefit on the second parent's death. And what's powerful is, is the premiums are substantially discounted, and so we're able to take relatively small premium to leverage that into a really meaningful benefit to fund the trust. It's remarkable. And we have access to almost every carrier in the industry that provides this, and so we shop till we drop. 
But the typical response for most parents when they see this is, how do they do it? I mean, for that small premium, how do they guarantee that much for my son or my daughter's special needs trust? So we, we do an incredible amount of work with this. And you know what's funny? This coverage originated as the best kept secret among the super wealthy. Because this coverage was actually designed to pay primarily federal estate taxes when the second spouse died, which is when the federal government comes. And most wealthy people do not have their money sitting liquid in the bank. They have it deployed. It's either in family-owned businesses or it's in farmland or this type of thing. It's not liquid. And it's a big problem if you have a 30 or 40 or 50 percent tax bill. And so this, this, this coverage was highly sought after by the very wealthy because it delivers a benefit at the same time the government needs to have taxes paid. And so what's amazing is, is that we in the special needs community said, aha, we have a need when the second spouse dies too. And that's to fund the trust. And so it's been, it's been a godsend. Okay. Um, as we get close to a quarter till, we're doing great. And if you've got questions, just, just dive in. As you can probably tell, there are a few things I enjoy more than sharing. Uh, information like this with, uh, with families. But the key to the process is having a team. Someone on the legal side, someone on the financial side working together collaboratively. I, um, I keep about eight attorneys busy uh, nonstop between Kentucky and Indiana uh, with all the, the thousands of families that we work with. Uh, and so we have strategic alliances to handle the legal side. We coordinate very closely and take the burden off of you, uh, uh, etc. But uh, whoever you work with needs to be a team of legal and financial to address all the issues. So, my quality professionals to assist you, remember you're the expert about your dependent, and it's all about their quality of life. Uh, I'm happy to take any and all questions. We touched on the waivers. Uh, we touched quite a bit on special needs trusts. Um, what I will tell you is, is uh, there are actually different types of special needs trusts. Um, and I mentioned that it's really important to work with people, uh, with uh, uh, special needs planners that do quite a bit of work with special needs because if you get the wrong trust, it can be very costly. Um, an example is, is there's a variety of special needs trust that has what's called a payback provision. A payback provision means that upon the, um, excuse me, upon the death of the trust beneficiary, uh, the state is paid back for Medicaid benefits that the individual has been afforded. And so what happens is, is when, the, when your child would die, the state would be a creditor on the trust, and before anything in the trust was able to catch up with siblings or other family members, the state would seek to reimburse themselves for all Medicaid and Medicaid waiver benefits afforded your child um, you know, during their lifetime, which means there probably wouldn't be much left. <laughs> uh, and and that's, that's an example of a, a costly uh, mistake that, that can be made if the wrong trust is utilized. Because that type of trust is actually uh, the type of trust that we use, and we use that trust. Uh, but that trust is used for assets of the disabled individual or settlements received in uh, uh, litigation situations where uh, there's been malpractice, personal injury liability, manufacturer liability, etc. And there's money coming to the disabled person. But we're wanting to reroute that money to the special needs trust so they can maintain their benefit eligibility. So this is, a, this is kind of what I'm saying. In other words, there are different types of trust for different situations. But practitioners that do not deal with this on a daily basis think, oh, I just need a special needs trust. And your odds of getting everything put together the way it's supposed to is, is um, it's risky business. And I know that because I have families that come in and this is what we have and I look at it and, and um, of course, you know, you're usually quick to find uh, the issues or problems that exist with it. So, um, what I mentioned before, uh, the initial consultation is free. There's absolutely no charge uh, whatsoever. And you bring, there's a checklist of items that you bring, and we look at everything that you're currently doing and determine what works, what doesn't, what are some appropriate next steps, et cetera. Again, we charge nothing for that. Um, we encourage, strongly encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, and we have modified hours. I even uh, keep uh, some Saturday hours for, uh, for people that want to come in on Saturday and avoid taking time off from work. Um, so I'm usually in the Indianapolis office at least one Saturday a month, and the Louisville office a Saturday a month. So I do that to try to accommodate people. Um, if you have existing documents where you've done some planning, uh, I have uh, special needs attorneys uh, that I, I do a business with where I can get document review at no expense or cost to you. I mean, we really, you know, try to go the extra mile to help families deal with these uh, with these complex issues. Um, other 
topics that you want to touch on or questions that you have. Um, and as we do that, uh, if you can figure your evaluation forms, because I do want to pass the grab bag and <laughs> have a little fun with that. I have uh, questions about the process. So after the initial consultation with your staff, um, looking over the documents, then you basically would walk away from that meeting with a to-do list, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. um, and some sort of a contract agreement. Uh, there are different levels of service depending upon the situation. So we determine, uh, number one, we determine uh, by evaluating your situation what would be an appropriate response. Right. Okay. And then we quantify any expense or costs involved in working through that. Okay. Um, and, um, and, and then uh, certainly 90 some odd percent of families do want to proceed uh, because we're the go-to statewide. I mean, you know, and, and there's some of this. Um, and we deliver value because attorneys that we work with are, are going to be less expensive than your dial of round. Uh, and that's because I know what they charge, I keep tabs on it. I know what the marketplace will share. If an attorney wants to work with me, they have to keep their fees in line. Um, and so there are oftentimes a savings as a result of working with one of our attorneys. Um, but uh, anyway, yes, uh, so we determine that cost involved the whole nine yards, also the process, the number of meetings, the number of trips to the Annapolis office, yeah. everything. All mapped, all mapped out, and that's and that's because we've done this. We've done it. Well, we've done it thousands of times. That's what they say. As a pastor, as a pastor of a church in Lafayette, I said, he says you're like Costco of special needs. Do you have any lawyers up here? I have one in Fort Wayne. That's probably the closest to here. But I will tell you, usually. We have the process set so that usually from beginning to end we can get it done in just three trips to right. Indianapolis. Yeah. And so most of the time we coordinate calendars so that we double up meetings. Yeah, right. Meeting nice. with the attorney come back. And frankly, as, as odd as it may seem, it's usually easier to do the double up meetings at Indianapolis than to attempt to coordinate calendars in two different cities mm -hmm. and then oh, yeah. at who's first, second, and this type of thing. Mm -hmm. And the attorneys I work with in Indianapolis, as an example, are all in the five minutes of my office. Mm -hmm. And so we'll often, for someone coming down with yourself, what we do is we have a mid-morning meeting, uh, mid meeting with me, mm -hmm. a break for lunch, meeting with the attorney, and then you head back. And uh, so we, we, I mean, we have right. Yeah, yeah. And we minimize the number of trips down, because I realize. And we, we figured that out early on as the scope, you know, became broader, you know. And so we got it down to three, the initial consultation, just two additional trips, and two meetings each trip. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's very efficient. Uh, it, is. Um, but uh, I'll be up at Warsaw uh, later this year. I was talking about that uh, a little bit ago. Uh, we have a lot of people in northern Indiana that we, that we work with. The Four County Co-op, uh, Northeast uh, Special Needs Co-op, the Four Counties, they have meet up every year. So we've got, you know, a lot, just lots of people up here. About the only area I've not gotten to is just that right outside of Chicago. Um, I think I'm still on tape, so I won't tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> that was that would be a bad time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. I guess I have one more question. Um, for long term care, that's like a horrific thought, but long term care options, do you ever see, I mean, do you see anything more than just, okay, you're on Medicaid now and you're going to be in the in a facility? Like if they're, you know, mm -hmm. functioning? Mm -hmm. Well, there are two issues there. One is yourselves as parents, meaning your long-term care situation. Right. Oh, yeah, that's true.